Phil, congratulations. Thank you. Very I, excited. <laughs> I bet. How does it feel? Um, it's only settling in now, right? So I, I found out obviously, you know, day or two before the players did, and then you know, day or two before it went public and everything. Um, I didn't sleep the night that I found out. Um, anybody that knows me, I talk a lot of crap about a lot of things. Like I'm never really <laughs> lost for words. But I got a call from Barry and Haas, you know, and, and I said like three words on the call. At the end of the call, Haas had to stop Barry hanging up to actually make me say if I accepted the job because I was just so lost for words. I was just so excited, but I was just like, this is amazing. What was your initial reaction to them telling you you had got the job? Um, somewhat disbelief, maybe. Um, not for, not for you know, my, my own ability to do anything like that, but you know, there was just a lot of really good candidates. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of other very valid choices they could have made. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and just, you know, I was kind of preparing myself, you know, stealing myself for, for bad news, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I just, just was so happy whenever I found out. I can tell it means a lot to you, yeah. this, especially <laughs> the fact that you didn't sleep. Yeah. Um, and I know you're a guy who enjoys his sleep, yes. so... Um, <laughs> Can you tell me what it is that you're most excited about getting into? Um, I think that the opportunity for change and the openness that the team has right now mm -hmm. for doing a lot of different exciting stuff, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously a, a huge gap left with, with James moving away from the team um, and retiring, you know, and, you know, a lot of transition in, in our defensive coaching staff as well. There's, there's, there's a lot of excitement around what we can do, right? Mm -hmm. But it's all, you know, it's all curiosity at the minute, right? Nobody really knows what we're going to do. Um, we're going to figure that out as we go along in the next couple of months, approaching pre-season. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what I'm most excited about. I'm most excited about working with the other coaches, filling out the staff, working with the players and figuring out how we're going to play Trojan football next year. Mm. And you are the man at the head of the ship. So really it's about playing your type of football. Yes. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is? It's much more process focused right so i i don't want to go into games you know saying oh we're going to go and score 40 points from the off because that's not going to happen never mind you know good opposition everything else it could just be horrific day weather wise right and we won't be able to move the ball throw the ball whatever mm -hmm. defensively we could have a mare and we play an amateur sport somebody's going to be working on holiday whatever so making sure that we can we can work and be be goal oriented and progress process focused so that mm -hmm. You know, we approach it one play at a time, we approach it one game at a time. We're not going to worry about what's going to happen at the end of the season. We're just going to go into the season, see what happens and, and play, you know, good fundamental football. Mm -hmm. be, be excited about it, mm -hmm. um, you know, play with good effort and like, you know, play up to the standard that we set for ourselves. I've gone through your coaching manual, uh, your coaching philosophy. Yeah. And particularly the word that stands out is compete. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about what competing on the pitch means to you not only in game day but on the practice field yeah i think i think on game day it's a lot about having a short-term memory there's no point in being upset over whatever you know blowing a block missing a tackle giving up a touchdown because it doesn't really matter if you're annoyed about it, it still happens you know we still had a negative outcome even or the other right you know if we scored we had a positive outcome but if the game's not over there's still a lot of things that can happen mm -hmm. um, and, and maintaining the discipline to to stay in the moment be patient with the game and, and really only looking at the scoreboard when the game is over, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find out what the result is and it's going to be a product of how we practice. So mm -hmm. we need to practice, you know, at, a, at an intensity that matches the game. We mm -hmm. need to practice in a manner that's, that's you know, that, that matches what games are like. Mm -hmm. we, we need to practice, you know, scenarios. We mm -hmm. need to practice fundamental skills and not get carried away into doing sort of, um, you know, social media content at practice, right? The practice has got to be about football. It's mm -hmm. got to be about guys showing up and, and mentally preparing themselves as much as it is physically for what a game is. And a part of that, and drawing on my own experience as head coach, that something that always struck me was something that Pete Carroll said in his book, that coaching was 80% communication and 20% your X's and O's. Being able to put things in a different way, being able to establish practice and establish that process in a way that makes sense, that has direct carryover into games. Have you thought about how you're going to implement your practice schedule, how you're going to implement your practices, how you're going to create that environment of clear, concise um, 
opportunity for players to compete and then bring it onto the pitch. Yeah, so, so there's, there's a lot of things that we've considered initially, but a large part of this is going to come down to the buy-in from the other coaches as well. So one of the conversations that I had during like the whole interview process was, you know, I was asked the question, um, would I be a coordinator under someone else? And I said, I didn't know because if I didn't get the job, they would have to sell me on their vision. So mm. that's what I've been spending the last sort of week and a bit doing is mm. talking to other coaches on the phone and everything else. Mm. Here's my vision. Do you want to be a part of it? And it's mm. not just do you want to do this thing that I want to do. It's mm. do you want to have value in it? Do you want to implement your own ideas? Mm. And do you want to put your own fingerprint on it as well? Because I can't do it alone. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's a great quote that you know, I came across on a clinic that I watched, which is none of us are greater than all of us. Mm. Um, you know, I, I can't go out and say I'm a phenomenal coach. Mm -hmm and expect that to carry the team to wins. You know, we can't have one good player and expect him to carry the teams to win. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be everybody. So the coaches are gonna have a large input in that as well. Um, but with that's gonna come by and, you know, they're gonna feel more valued. They're gonna feel, you know, more, more ownership over what we do as well, which mm -hmm. will breed the culture. It'll blend itself into the players. And then when we practice how we wanna practice, it'll bleed into games. Can you tell me some of the challenges that you find in coaching at this level? Particularly, you mentioned earlier, and we'll have to have a joke, <laughs> that it is Ireland, yep. and sometimes the weather at games yep. is terrible. What other challenges do you have in mind, and how do you intend to overcome them? Um, you know, one of the issues, I guess, with it being the amateur sport is just normal things, you know, practice attendance. Every club's going to deal with, you know, issues of practice attendance, and it's, it's having... For one, you know, I guess, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a depth of squad, you know, you get better reps with, you know, your twos, your threes and, and however, whatever else. Um, and that comes with, you know, coaches coaching up, right? We shouldn't be coaching down to the, you know, the very bottom level of, of, of our rookie pool. We should always be coaching to the highest standard that we can and asking people to challenge themselves to, to train and play up to that. Mm. Um, you know, because the same thing's gonna happen on game day. Um, we, we could end up not having a starting player for whatever reason. Mm. Um, and we're gonna be forced into asking someone to, to fill that spot. Um, mm. And so there's no point in us trying to avoid that scenario at practice as best we can. We need to prepare ourselves for it so that they're ready to go as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna ask a little question that changes gears slightly. You're a long time player. Yeah. Oftentimes players have a hard job to transition and you've represented Ireland so yeah. you played at a very good level do you think you're gonna have a problem transitioning to the sideline um, not really um, I you know going back maybe five six years now you know I had originally stopped playing and was just coaching mm -hmm. um, didn't particularly miss playing right it was you know really good fun um, the opportunity to get a cap for Ireland was, was one of the reasons I initially had sort of dipped back into playing. You know, the Wolfhounds program was starting up and it was going really well. You know, I knew mm -hmm. guys that were involved in it mm -hmm. and wanted the challenge. You know, I just, I didn't want to give up playing and have never really tried to see if I could do that. Yeah. And so I was able to do that and, you know, obviously got to start and, and we won the, the home game against Belgium there. But mm -hmm. I've always got more personally out of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the playing's hard. Um, <laughs> like physically, it's exhausting, you know. Um, coaching for me is more more interesting. You know, there's there's I just feel there's a there's a much bigger kind of mental challenge around it. Right, it's mm -hmm. really stimulating to to work with guys and converse with guys and, and figure out not just the X's and O's, but what makes them tick. You know, mm. like is this a guy that I need to you know gently push along, or is this a guy I need to you know shout out on game day? Mm -hmm. Different people respond to different motivations, and and that challenge has always been really interesting to me. Do you have any coaching idols? <sighs> Probably Sean McVeigh, which you'll obviously be happy with. Um, it's not just because we created no, a song I, together yeah, I for know, him. I know. <laughs> um, Sean McVeigh, Scott Frost, another one. Um, mm. So early on, whenever I was getting into coaching, um, was watching a, a Coach of the Year clinic um, mm. that, that Scott Frost had a, a huge. Uh, I think it was like a sixty-minute segment on it. It was just. It was just. He was talking about a lot of kind of um, architectural stuff around, like the the Oregon offense when he was there. It was the time when he was at UCF, um, and one of the things he was talking about was you know you don't have to think about uh, an up-tempo no huddle as a spread offense, right? You can mm -hmm. run an up-tempo no huddle out of a power eye. Mm -hmm. And that was like a, a light switch for me, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, wait, we can do all these other different concepts and things mm -hmm. in different manners. It's not mm -hmm. just how it's been done before. It's, can we bring this concept that's, you know, really 
uh, a huge part of a West Coast offense, and can we just put in this little spread that we're doing? You know, mm -hmm. and, and can it work? Can we find ways to maneuver the personnel around, you know, to create mismatches and, and lever out leverage a defense? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like like I think those two guys, you know, Sean McVay is a lot more uh, around, I guess, the the cerebral side of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong, you know, obviously phenomenal, you know, scheme scheme coach, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like like the, everything that we've ever seen with with Sean McVay is just being you know mm -hmm. process oriented. Exactly. It's, it's one step at a time. Mm -hmm. There's no getting ahead of themselves. There's no understanding of we're looking to do this against another team. It is only about like what they do each day. Yeah. And from everything that you've said, that sounds like that's yeah. exactly what you're I, looking yeah, for. Yeah, I think I think every game we should we should only be focused on ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, and it's it's no disrespect to any opponent that we'll play. It's mm -hmm. it's. The caliber of football we play is entirely controlled by us. You know, and if we win and lose games, it's not going to be because a team has come in and, and, and outperformed us. It's going to be because we've left plays out there. It's because we've missed opportunities or we've not executed. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're going to set our own standards. We're going to game plan for teams correctly. Mm -hmm. And if we don't win games, it's going to be because we haven't executed that game plan. I mean, um, when I moved into the, the head coaching position, one thing that always struck me, like you, I had several quotes that really meant a lot to me. And one was Bill Belichick was said that 90% of your scouting is self-scouting. Yeah. Make sure your players are getting off the line well. Make sure your players are backpedaling better. After that, because also there's a sort of stoic fundamental, fundamentality around that, or mentality around that, which is you can't control the weather. You can't yeah. control everything. You can't control what the opponent is going to run. But you can control your effort. You can control your technique. And I do appreciate that that's something that like, is very, very close to your, your, yeah. your coaching heart. I think that also one thing that I like is, um, is hearing you trying to under articulate the idea of communication. Yeah. It seems a Coach Frost's point about like, being able to like, reimagine concepts that a, a no-huddle, up-tempo offense has always been associated with a West Coast, but never with a power eye. But being able to like, reimagine certain concepts um, so they're easy to digest, that they're easy to implement. Is there anything that you really want to, if there could be a Coach Gunning fingerprint that is similar to Coach McVeigh or Coach Frost on the Belfast Trojans, what is it? Speed, like mm. I, I, wielding tempo as a weapon, right? Mm. So not just not huddling, right? It's, mm. it's about how fast can we push that and still execute, mm -hmm. you know? Um, even, you know, being involved, you know, other clubs in the Ireland program and stuff, you know, whenever teams do no huddle well, um, it's really off-putting for defences. I mean, we've seen it last year with UCD winning the Shamrock Bowl. You know, they, they, you know, they really ran away with that game uh, in the second half um, on the back of that. You know, they, they found some really successful plays. They got some good looks um, from the Rebels' defence. And, you know, they were able to just call the plays and execute them at a tempo faster than the defense could adapt, the faster mm -hmm. they get audible, the faster they can get better personnel on the field. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I, I definitely want to bring. You know, we're, we're going to practice at a much higher tempo. We'll get more practice reps out of it, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, one of the, the, the quotes that I've seen um, you know, around this sort of stuff is, you know, if you, if you average 40 offensive plays a game and you score mm -hmm. 20 points a game, if you just go no huddle and go fast enough, you'll run 60 plays a game and you'll score 30 points a game. If you, if you improve nothing else, mm -hmm. just if you just improve your snap count. Sounds like money ball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> You're gonna get the analytics team in, is that the next step for the Belfast? Yeah, Trojans? well I mean, like, I, professionally, like I'm a, like a software developer, I'm mm -hmm. working with data every mm -hmm. day. You know, I, I work for, like, a, as a consultancy for, mm -hmm. um, mostly for investment banks. You know, mm -hmm. like everything I, I kind of do professionally is data. You know, I brought some of that to the, the Wolf Hunt stuff as well, my mm -hmm. role there at coaching. We, we've, taken the data off Huddle and we've ran it through algorithms and we've mm. gotten player grades out of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting stuff there that nobody's doing here, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a you know, potential opportunity to do a lot of cool stuff, like enriching our, our Huddle footage a lot better, mm. getting a lot more value out of that. That mm -hmm. it takes a lot of stress off coaches having to manually do a lot of stuff as well and you can right. give us some time back to, to find other uses for. Well, I mean, the fact is, is then this is something that we've talk, talked about, is the, the time suck of coaching yeah. and one thing that the one piece of advice that I would always be mindful of and, and make sure to, to put on your, on your plate is don't let this take over your life yeah. because 
it is an amateur sport and you can apply a professional attitude. And it was great to hear that you're, you're using that professional skill to actually reduce time as yeah. well. So um, I hope that, you know, it doesn't, this is something that is enriching for you as it is yeah. for, for the players as well. And um, on that note, is there anything that you're anxious about? I don't think so. Um, I've, I've coached forever, right? Mm. Like, I mean, I've, I've coached nearly as long as I've played the sport. Um, I've coached other sports, you know. Um, I've coached individual athletes for, for weightlifting and, mm -hmm. you know, been around some, some high caliber athletes as well. I, I don't have an anxiousness around entering the season. I think I, think I would be more anxious about the season ending. Um, mm. when, whenever I'm approaching that reflection period after the year and, and wondering, had I done enough? Mm. But going in, I don't have any doubts about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I definitely think that with the experience that I have and, and the player set that we have, it, it affords me a lot of flexibility to, to, to maybe make some mistakes and mm -hmm. still be successful. Who are you going to lean on? doesn't have to be names, but what, who are the types of people that you want to um, lean on? I think you know, it would be silly to not lean on the offensive line that we have. You know, we, have we have four guys that are currently within the Ireland setup. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we have a wealth of experience, obviously, in Jerome as well, um, mm -hmm. who's you know, played and coached football at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and myself as well, you know, having sort of cut my teeth for a long time as an offensive line coach, that's, that's definitely an area that's going to get a lot of attention in terms of how we play football on the offens offensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and equally, you know, defensively, we're, we're, we're going to have to find a lot of players that are going to contribute right away. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so our defensive coaching staff is going to be lent on quite a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's a big emphasis there on them being able to, to teach and lead people the right way to be able to play football. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I guess the result of that will generally lean on the offense, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we have a good running back, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of hangs around and scores a lot. So right. um, he'll be a big part of it and the offensive line is obviously going to help him. <laughs> the guy who's played on other teams. Yep. And prior to joining the Trojans, you happened to sort of witness like a time period where we emerged and sort of like for a period of time, we were yep. pretty much the top dogs. What was it? Was there anything that you admired at the time whenever you looked at our club or was there anything that you felt that that was something that it was akin to a philosophy that you could recognize? Yeah, think? I think the one thing, I, I think more than most, I think I had an appreciation for how much the sport was being driven forward. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a, a standard being set that was definitely beyond what other clubs were doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and before the Trojans, it was the Rebels, you know, and before the Rebels, it was the Vikings, and before them, it was the other Rebels, right? Um, you know, and, but it always goes that way. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's sort of this, I guess, cyclical path of, you know, mm. clubs figuring out something that nobody else has figured out yet mm. and doing it really well. Um, and then everybody else has to play catch up. So, mm. but I really like that because it's what everybody should be striving to do anyway. Um, you know, and, and now I guess, you know, we, we've done a really good job last season with the off field stuff as well. You mm. know, so the Trojans are still in that mindset as an organization of, we want to push as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. And disappointing as it might have been to, to miss the playoffs last year, there's still a lot of successful things we can draw on from that as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think we're going to draw from that, from last season? Um, I, I, think, I think a lot of guys are going to have to reflect on what they contributed, um, how they performed, you know. Coming out of COVID wasn't easy for anybody. Um, mm. You know, we, we, we played some exhibition games against, uh, you know, Craig Alvin and a scrimmage with the Rebels during the break. Um, but... Mm -hmm. There was definitely a different kind of energy pre-COVID to post-COVID, you know, just guys, you know, couldn't go to the gyms, guys, you know, couldn't train and do everything they would have done before. General attrition of players, you know, guys getting jobs, moving away and whatever else. And I guess the whole, you know, advent of home working, you know, has also mm. meant that guys maybe live further away now. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, as, as far as seasons go, yes, it was disappointing, but... Um, as far as extenuating circumstances go, that was pretty out there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, guys being able to reflect on that and understand where we fell down, mm -hmm. you know, where, were we, you know, um, not prepared well enough? Mm -hmm. Were we not conditioned well enough? You know, mm -hmm. did we enter games with sort of too much bravado of, you know, mm -hmm. in 2019, the last time there was a real season, you know, the Trojans were the champs, you know, was mm -hmm. there too many people that still entered games, you know, even though it was three, four years later, mm -hmm. um, you know, with that kind of mentality that, that was a bit of a downfall. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, again, where we come back to being mm -hmm. process focused. It's not about going into every game and sort of beating our chest and saying, mm -hmm. you know, we're the best. It's about, you know, can we just execute to our standards? Can we perform as well as we can? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then go from there. So 
Coach, you mentioned earlier about how you're going to communicate. You're one man. Yep. You get the opportunity to speak at the start of practice and at the end of practice, start of games, end of games, halftime as well. The day-to-day, -day, daily, everyday communication is going to be via your coaches. How do you want them to communicate? Um, on the field, concisely. We don't have time to sort of stand around for 10, 15, 20 minute um, Lecture is probably the wrong word, but you know, for, for, for one way discussion, right? Um, you know, our, our practice minutes are so valuable. We, we're not a college program practicing 10, 20 hours a week. You know, we have a matter of minutes, not hours. Um, you know, so, so all of that sort of verbose installation mm -hmm. or explanation of, of whatever clarification it needs to be, mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it through meetings. You know, we'll be doing it through remote calls, meetings at, you know, at, at Harlequins or whatever, but. Mm -hmm. um, the, the actual coaching delivery needs to be within drills, within scrimmages, and it's got to be you know concise one two word coaching points mm -hmm. that are impactful to the players because we'll have put the time in off the field you know so we can say something like you know, uh, you know feet to a wide receiver and he implicitly mm -hmm. knows all of the kind of periphery coaching points that go along with that and be able to self diagnose oh my feet are the wrong way around or I'm not aligned correctly or whenever I enter that block I, you know I even feet or, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and, and to just make those coaching points so much more efficient, you know, mm -hmm. especially if we're doing stuff, you know, like moving at tempo, we don't have time to stop. Mm -hmm. One message to the players coming back for the Trojans, what is it? Um, be in shape, I think. Um, some guys obviously will be. Um, some guys will obviously use their off season and sort of, you know, uh, do what I'm doing and go to barbecue festivals, right? Yeah, you're a coach now though. Yeah, I, I can sort of do what I want. I don't need to be in shape as long as I can walk up and down a sideline. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if we're going to play at the intensity, play with the effort and, and at the tempo that we want, um, you know, one of the sacrifices that we make is that we can't make substitutions. So, you know, if we're on a roll in offense, you know, part of the you know, goal of that is to keep the same defense personnel on the field. Mm -hmm. And if we have to make a substitution because someone's not in shape, it disadvantages us so mm -hmm. much, so much more than it, did, you know, than it would, would have hurt us before because, um, you know, the defense then has the opportunity to substitute as well. You know, they can bring on fresh players, mm -hmm. they can bring on fresh play calls, they can, they can do a lot of things that will take away from what we're doing offensively. Mm -hmm. um, and then defensively, the guys need to be in shape as well. You know, again, you know, there's a transition happening in the league that a lot of teams are moving to in the huddle. Um, they need to be prepared to be in shape and be able to communicate effectively when they're tired as well. You know, mm -hmm. it's one thing being able to run up and down a field. It's a whole other thing to be able to, to relay information to your teammates when you're that gassed as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think if there was, there was one thing, just kind of put some work in. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson used to tell yeah. that to the Cowboys and I always stuck. OK, so a message to the fans of the Trojans. Um, it's going to be exciting, you know, mm -hmm. it was already a really good day out with everything else we had on, you know, with mm -hmm. all the stuff with the Dragon Claw, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the bouncy castles, all the fun stuff we had, mm -hmm. all free food. Um, the football on the field is going to be uh, hopefully electric, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to do a lot of really fun stuff um, offensively, you know, defensively, the guys are going to be focused on generating turnovers. It's going to be the kind of football that you want to watch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll sit there and, you know, you'll be seeing people making plays. Mm -hmm. This is a transitional time for the Trojans. We are moved away from our legacy quarterback, yep. guy who's been responsible for all of our Shamrock Bowls and someone that you know, I've worked closely with over the years and you know, have a great deal of admiration yep. as a player, as a friend. And most importantly, even though everything he brought to the field, in my opinion, made him the most important player in this club's history, and that's probably gonna stay that way. Um, what he brought as a leader, like without the the skills and technique was what was most important how do you plan on um filling the the very big void left by james that's a good question um yeah so i think that you know it's leading by example i'm i'm, I'm never really been a big sort of rah-rah motivational guy it's always been that i'm going to put in more work than anybody else um you know and if people at least try to repay that with their own effort you know mm. That's a lot of um, that's a lot of the way there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of the way there to getting guys to playing hard and playing with effort, um, and coaches being committed to the process as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't get me wrong. Like I've you know been able to dabble in some motivational stuff. You know, in the past with coaching, but it's it's usually as a result of you know a situational necessity, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that's happening again. We need to get guys fired up, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just think, you know, a lot of the leadership side of it um, will come down to that, that sort of delegation of responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we've said, already said, you know, 
it's not a one-man band. You know, like I, I'm going to lean heavily on the other coaches around me and the rest of the staff as we fill it out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the motivation, at least at a you know positional group level, is going to be down to those coaches. You know, at an offensive and defensive level, it's going to be down to those coordinators. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, for me, it's just a, it's a nudge in the right direction. You know, and it's as I said, you know, like a, a nice sort of guiding hand on it all that. Mm-hmm. We play to the standard that we're capable of. We play with the effort that's required, and, and we play Trojan football. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the leadership, you know, will then just trickle down. You know, guys will lead, captains will lead, position coaches will lead, and you know, we'll be successful through them. So, a couple of fun questions, Phil, because yes. we're very content oriented at the Trojans, as you might have noticed. Yes. So you probably felt this is coming. Um, we had collectively about two hundred thousand likes between. You, me, and the Leckies, because we invented a song for Sean McVeigh. Yes. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> Vaguely. Yeah. I want to ask if you had to have a song that the Trojans <laughs> fans had to chant, what tune would it be? What tune would it be? Mm-hmm. That's a horrendous question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, uh, After everything that I've said about like you know you collaborating and delegating and yeah. all the rest of it, I'm putting you in the spotlight now. I don't know. I'm you know I'm a big fan of you know rock bands and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. You know we could uh, it could all go really poorly. It could be to the chin of Highway to Hell. Um, all right. You know. <laughs> That's um, good. Maybe it goes the other way and it's a stairway Whenever to heaven. Whenever we want you out of the job. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. It. Or we could you know just you know go eight and zero and it's stairway to heaven. But. Uh, Nice. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 see what the players come up with. You know, uh, I like it. Your socials. <laughs> yeah, you're very collaborative in terms of what they uh, how they should appreciate or not appreciate yeah. you. So let the results speak yeah. for themselves. Very good. Um, okay, favorite all time player NFL. Oh, Michael Vick. Okay. Right. I Oof, I you went with the spicy I one. I know. I know. <laughs> I got into football. Like I got into. The, the NFL in general, just because I had a friend and who took an interest at the same time as I did. But mm-hmm. I, I'm a Falcons fan because, oh, who's good, right? And we like opened up, you know, went and bought Madden in 2004 and he was on mm-hmm. the cover. And was, oh, like, I mean, you know, he's, he's just was an electric player. He was fun, mm-hmm. like, above all, like, was fun to watch. Was Amazing. not a tremendously successful quarterback for the Falcons. You know, individually, we didn't, we didn't really win, win. Um, mm-hmm. We were but, never, but, you know, a... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shamrock or a Super Bowl contending team. Definitely year. would have won a Shamrock Bowl. De- I think Michael Vick could have <laughs> taken 10 random people and won a Shamrock Bowl, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, just an electrifying player and, and, and kind of just fun. Mm. You know? mm. Yeah, very fun. And especially, he was a bit of a cheat code in that year in Madden, yes. as I recall. I mean, when are we going to see a quarterback with 4 2 speed? Yeah. Ever again? Yeah. Potentially not. Yeah. So, favorite ever position you played? I really enjoy playing fullback. Um, I think I could probably count carries on a single hand, <laughs> um, but I loved it. I mm. mean, th- that for me was where kind of a lot of the uh, more interesting aspects of blocking schemes started to become apparent, right? Okay. So, you know, uh, being able to just line up in different spots, mm-hmm. you know, you can line up a tight end, you can line up in an eye, you can line up offset, you can mm-hmm. line up in shotgun and all these different things. And then block different players on the same run mm-hmm. scheme, right? And create different outcomes, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really cool. I always really enjoyed my time playing fullback. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, took a weird sense of pride in not carrying the ball because I just wanted to hit people, mm-hmm. um, you know, and just sort of be a little bit sort of tough nosed about it. Um, mm-hmm. But that was good fun, you know? Um, you know, scored one or two accidental touchdowns along the way, <laughs> um, which, which was good crack, but... Uh, the best kind. Yeah. Um, but no, I, th- I think definitely fullback. Um, the dinosaur but, position. Yes, 100%, because, yeah, maybe we won't even use one, you know. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound like you're interested, but... Uh, it just depends who's around, you know. Mm-hmm. Mo might be watching. Mm-hmm. You won't have the, <laughs> the urge to, like, suddenly get in on a goal line no, style. No, no, no. That was, that was many pounds ago as well. So. <laughs> okay, well, it's good that you're going the... Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. What is that, many pounds to be a blocking fullback or many pounds to... No, no, <laughs> I've, I've, I've transitioned closer to the football okay, uh, as yeah. time has gone on. So, um, The funniest slash dumbest piece of coaching advice that was ever given to you oh, doesn't have to be American football. Uh, I was at an American football practice mm-hmm. where um, we were being given pretty accurate medical advice on where to hit people to cause injuries. Um, okay. So right. that mm-hmm. wasn't good. Mm-hmm. That's probably not good social media content. That was probably not the one no, I was going for. But fine. at the same time, 
I mean, I'm glad that, you know, that yeah. speaks to the integrity of which you're trying yeah. to coach this team. Yeah, that was, that was not fun. Mm -hmm. At the time, you know better. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, I was very young. Um, mm -hmm. But on reflection, that was, that was some, some pretty dark coaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that would be very rightly called out now. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll <laughs> transition to a fun one, then, okay. which is like, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you or that you have witnessed whilst on the pitch? Um, one of my favourite football memories um, was, was coaching, obviously, at another club. Um, we lost two quarterbacks. And in stepped a rookie offensive lineman who had had like, you know, he had a big arm um, mm -hmm. at quarterback. And it was at a time where the QBs were calling the plays. And the first play that he called was a toss reverse with the QB leading uh, off of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think it went for about four yards, but like he destroyed somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, yeah, just, it was just such excitement, right? Like it was just great because... Here's this kid who kind of, you know, had, had just been around for six months, whatever mm -hmm. it was. It's just like, I'm just going to do the most crazy thing in the playbook because it's great fun. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And it just, just juiced everybody up. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for sitting down. I think the fans and the players have a real unique insight and clear and concise insight into where we're going as a team. I personally can't wait to see what you do with the job. I think it's going to be great, particularly working on that process every day, which is always about the uh, the journey not the destination yeah. so thank you very much thank you very much thank you. and you mentioned um I've lost the question <laughs> sorry right. looking we ain't live um is it like you uh <laughs> oh